Good morning to all of you. The presentation will be in English, but I will speak in Greek, and I think that this is very befitting here. Last time we were together was uh, in Ceres, if I'm not mistaken. So things looked different back then. I think we're trying to adjust to what is happening. We hope that uh, we'll go back to normality and all this will be part of the past at some point. But until that happens, we have to adjust to what we currently have. So what I want to do during my presentation, brief, short presentation, is show you the way in which in the, within the European Commission, within the Council, and the European Parliament have already decided upon the direction of the common agricultural policy, which responds to a large extent to what was said earlier on in terms of the agri-food system. But given that the previous speaker mentioned and spoke about the challenges we face, let us have a look at the global challenges. Can I also see my presentation because I don't have it here on the screen before me. So the world food system is uh, at this point for a few years now I'd say rapidly moving it's trying to adjust to the new data and what is happening to be more specific is as follows for many decades we had economic progress, which was based on a series of um, indices that we could measure. They were measurable, whether that had to do with the growth of the economy or with the social welfare. At the same time, there, were, there was a degradation of the environment, so the soil, the water, biodiversity, all of that. So there was uh, things happening at the expense of the environment. And at this point, simultaneously, we're trying to solve a series of uh, financial and environmental problems. Choosing technological methods that are more advanced compared to the past. We have uh, the digital economy. But at the same time, we understand that there's a series of uh, conflicts and potentially increasing social tensions because not everyone's at the same level and not everyone's facing the same problems. And uh, the, the UN, the FAO, have a series of analysis showing the gaps, the significant knowledge gaps and the significant uh, digital divide of our times. So this is the transition we're going through it. And what is of uh, the utmost importance now is to be able to use the agriculture's unique potential in order to have uh, net job gains and to turn that into, turn this challenge into a growth strategy, a procedure of growth. I think this is easier to say than do, actually, and this is why we need to understand how we translated this strategy of this transition from the farm to fork, as we say, the farm to fork strategy, and how the fourth generation of uh, farming and agriculture plays a role in that, so farming 4.0. So farm to fork, uh, we speak about supply and demand, the link between the two. And for the supply shifts, it's clear that uh, sometimes we have some opposing trends. Quite often, farmers and producers lay a lot of emphasis on the recommendations for environmental protection that lead to a higher cost of production So I'd say in the short term, many of the recommendations lead to higher cost, but at the same time, the advances of technology and uh, the advances of um, good uh, farming practices show that the cost, 
the production cost can be reduced. Because what happens is we forget what happens in uh, the progress that can reduce mid-term the cost and link that to the development and growth of uh, further skills on behalf of the farmers and producers. This is why this is important, because there are also demand shifts, not just supply shifts, but also demand shifts from changes in income and in pricing and uh, a significant impact, actually, in stemming from the preferences of consumers. And the preferences of consumers are not the same all over the world, and they're not fixed, that they change over time, and they're also affected by historic uh, events and things happening in the world. So we need to take into account the fact that on a global level, these uh, developments do not always move in the same direction. So the farm to fork strategy, there is this transition, this link, as we said, uh, from, with, between production and consumption. All this happens uh, at a time when there's a lot of change in pricing. And it's not just uh, the agri-food sector. Think about the energy sector as well. So there's this uncertainty of people in terms of the changes in prices. Uncertainty, an uncertainty which is uh, also affected by climate change and extreme weather conditions. So if we can sum up the dilemma we had within uh, the European Commission when we made some recommendations and su submitted our proposals was to respond to the citizens' demands, respond to the globalisation challenges, the agreements already made in Paris regarding climate change, so COP21 and the SDGs from the United Nations, the SDGs commitments, while asking ourselves whether today's agriculture can produce at global level more food at a lower cost, lower environmental cost to a large extent as well. Quite often the debate is uh, whether this needs to happen in uh, the European Union or in which countries. And of course, there's always room for improvement in terms of reducing our consumption. Our society consumes a lot, but our society is only a small segment of the world population. There are very significant agri-food needs. The European uh, Union, bear in mind, is only 6-7% of the world population, so there's more than 90% of the population that has different food needs, agri-food needs, uh, different to ours. So we need to have um, a clear contribution of the European Union to that. So the common agricultural policy, moving on to that, what was the starting point? We understood that we had to guarantee, and safeguard an enhanced climate and environmental ambition for the EU agriculture. And we had to do that while recognising the sophistication, innovation and resilience of the EU food system, because we're at the top in terms of the innovation, in terms of efficiency. And this is clear. We've seen that so with uh, the COVID crisis, COVID-19 crisis. If you look at the agri-food uh, sector, you will see that this is the only sector that presented no reduction of its income compared to other sectors. And, of course, we need to have shifting support towards performance monitored with uh, pertinent data. What are the adjustments we had to make during this process? Because of COVID-19, of course, there was a series of actions at EU level showing uh, that uh, common action can bring better results. In Brussels, where I am, 
I can assure you that we were <laughs> criticised a lot about uh, vaccines at first. And then, as things moved on better, people again forgot about the European Commission. But so it was joint common actions that led to better results. And the target of this strategy is to have a series of growing societal expectations on their delivery as part of the future common agricultural policy. So common EU response to environmental and climate challenges and growing societal expectations. There will be further adjustments to that at the end of the year. And then moving on to what needs to be done to better link the common agricultural policy to the Green Deal. First of all, we need to see clearly the high ambition which is reflected in the agreed legislation. This is something that member states need to do. And number two, we need to identify areas or, uh, and sectors where certain improvements can close the identified gaps in member states' SWOSH analysis, because we've seen that at the, within the European Commission, and member states have seen that. They've made this SWOSH analysis. And number three, accelerate the shift to dig digitalization to exploit the benefits from knowledge-based best practices, because not only can we communicate with the broader audience, this Congress, in fact, shows the capabilities we have. But at the same time, we need to understand that there are some things missing. There are certain gaps in technology. Because what is missing is knowledge on behalf of a large part of the population or the infrastructure. And in the agri-food sector, this is very important. So being in Greece after a long time, I've tried to show you some diagrams to explain our conclusions. Uh, and this is one of them. It's the cap budget composition reflecting policy change. The greener it is, the more, the, the greener, I would say, the policies and we hope things will improve in terms of the procedures for the transition that we want to achieve. So on the right you can see uh, what happens as a share of the GDP and what is important is uh, the budget and the impact actually, how we can strengthen and support the income of uh, farmers and producers. Then uh, the competitiveness of the agri-food sector, again, significant changes, very impressive changes, and the impact on uh, the lower emissions. Again, we've made progress. There was significant progress during the first few years, but then we moved on to, I'd say, some sort of stagnation. And that shows the uh, extent of uh, the climate change. Again, some more diagrams showing the soil organic carbon stocks in various EU member states current irrigated surface area and current irrigation efficiency in agriculture. To address the challenges, we have nine targets, nine objectives that are very closely related to one another. These are the CAP objectives, the Common Agriculture Policy objectives. Member states need to uh, transpose that into their own legislation. I think I have to move on faster. Three takeaways on the farm to fork and the common agriculture policy. Number one, it is clear that there is continuum in the common agriculture policy, but there are also some breaks in the nature of the CAP reforms. So this is what happens with uh, the latest recommendation for the CAP reform and 
how it was voted on. The general orientation does not change, but it is strengthened by aiming to link, link all actors in the food chain. Then it's very important to highlight that there is no monopoly of good agri-food practices, best practices. There is no monopoly of best practices when it comes to sustainability. It depends on uh, the climate conditions, on uh, the soil, it depends on the know-how, on the knowledge, the practices of various uh, actors involved. And different practices can bring about equally good results. We've seen that in a series of examples in the last few years during our congresses. But what is very important is to be able to measure the starting point and then to understand the progress achieved over the years. So we want measurable results. And of course, there's the role of science, the role of science in accelerating an ongoing transition. I belong to this generation of economists that took it for granted that when we get some data from international organizations, then this is data that we respect. There was great debate as to whether we could change this data towards one or another direction, but we would not doubt the fact that the Earth is not flat, but it's round. In today's society, we've reached a point when there's actually uh, a questioning of the science as such. We've seen that uh, when discussing the COVID-19 vaccines, and we've seen that in other areas as well. So unless we place, we fight in order to place the science at the centre of our debate to understand how science can help us in the future, I think that the success of the policy we'll have, of the strategy we'll have, will be problematic. And where do we go from here? We need to keep the momentum that we currently have, especially uh, in terms of the conferences, the UN conferences regarding agri-food systems. We need to build alliances at global level, highlighting and showcasing the common experiences, the joint targets and objectives of all parties involved. And, of course, convince people with examples, using examples, that uh, agriculture, which is based on knowledge, mm -hmm. is something that uh, actually exists because no farmer, no producer is going to listen to what a bureaucrat in Brussels has to say or a politician has to say. They, they will take that into account, but they will be convinced if they see their neighbour implementing something different that actually works. And that shows that the importance of highlighting the particularities and the diversity in terms of the experience people face, even at local level. Thank you very much.